pull it. I don't know. Do you guys care who goes first? Whatever the bro wants is that's fine. No, I don't mind. Et e- e- can go first. Okay, right, so, go, first. Uh, go ahead then, Ett. As soon as you start talking, this is just a quick introduction. I'll give you two minutes for an introduction. Go ahead. All right, that sounds that sounds pretty good. So uh, my introduction will be this: um, I, I am Nathan Roberts, also known as Ett, stands for uh, End Time Teacher, which is the name of my YouTube channel, and uh, I will confess to be a Hebrew Israelite. I've been a follower of Christ for 10 years now this month, actually. And um, my side of the position of the debate tonight is that polygamy is um, allowed according to the scriptures. And one way I will back my argument, just for people know before we get into the discussion, is I use the entire Bible, both Old Testament, Apocrypha, and the New Testament, right? Everything from Genesis to Malachi, all the way down to Revelation. All of that is considered to be the inspired word of God. And we can, um, you know, use any of that to find out what is the correct doctrine. Say, for instance, if we want to learn about the law of God, well, we go to the four uh, books of Moses where he gave the law. That's where we find out what God gave as far as the commandments. So when we go into the New Testament, which I'm sure we'll do tonight, uh, the way that we can properly understand what we read in the New Testament, of course, would be going back to the Old Testament. And I will also show where Christ also to obey the law from the Old Testament. So just to, to give my introduction, that's my standpoint on it. And uh, I'll be short with that. Cool, man. Okay, so uh, we will uh, let Caden introduce himself and then we'll go back to ETT for the opening argument. So uh Quick introduction, bro. Caden, go ahead. When you start talking, right. you got two minutes. All right. So, um, my name is Neil, but you could all call me Caden. Uh, and t- I'm I'm a Trinitarian Christian, thinking about Eastern Orthodoxy and stuff like that. You know, just viewing different things. And I'm I'm just here to discuss on this certain topic of if you can have multiple wives as a Christian. So. That's quite literally as simple as that. Like, I, I don't really got anything else interesting going on. Yep, that's pretty much all of it. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, that was going to have a third tickets, man. A fancy introduction. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was gonna have a fancy introduction, but but basically, like if you go to the New Testament and the Old Testament and church tradition, et cetera, et cetera, uh, it quite literally does not teach that you can have multiple wives. So, sorry, I'll be right there. Yeah, that, that that's fine, Nick. Uh, but but before we get into the chat, Neo, just so I understand, you believe in the entire Bible, right? Genesis to Revelation. That's your position. Yeah. Yes, and okay. I believe in church tradition and stuff. So, okay, and um, let me just give a little background real quick, because the whole reason I asked to do this discussion was um, I yesterday I sat down and I was listening to the discussion that y'all did a couple of days back, and one of my buddies. Right, uh, sorry Rudy, about that, guys. Okay, so uh, ETT. You ready, bro? You got five minutes for your opening argument as soon as you start. Yeah, I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay, go ahead. Okay, good. So um, real quick, I'll finish with the statement, and then I'll continue because I, I really don't need the whole time. I can prove it easy. But real quick, going back to what I was saying, um, I was listening to one of my buddies, Rudy. He called into the stream, and y'all were having a back and forth about multiple topics. But then I heard about the polygamy. I was like, you know what? Maybe me and Caden can do a discussion about it because it's uh, definitely a um, you know good topic to have a discussion uh, you know, regarding the scriptures around. So anyway, getting into the introduction, right? So um, what I'm going to show is when we go into the law in the Old Testament, we see that God allows a man to have more than one wife. And this is very important to show because, again, going back to the statement I made in my introduction, when we read the Bible, the place that we find the law, statutes, and the commandments is the Old Testament. And Christ himself he taught to obey the law in the Old Testament. I'll give you one example. When you read Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 and 19, Christ said, hey, look, 
I didn't come to do away with any of the law. Anybody who teaches men to break even the very least of God's law, that man will be least in the kingdom. But those men who teach to keep the law, those are going to be great in God's kingdom. So Christ didn't come to the earth to teach you to just love everybody and uh, just follow like free things. That's just not true. He clearly taught to follow what was in the, um, the law. So I'm going to give two examples in my introduction here. In the Old Testament, where it is allowed to have more than one wife, such as Deuteronomy chapter uh, 21 and verse 15. We're going to see a guideline here about how a man's supposed to operate himself if he has more than one wife. It says, if a man have two wives, more than one, one beloved and another hated, and they have borne him children, both the beloved and the hated. And if the firstborn son be hers that was hated, then it shall be when he makes his sons to inherit that which he has, that he may not make the son of the beloved firstborn before the son of the hated, which is indeed the firstborn. But he shall acknowledge the son of the, of the hated for the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all that he has, for he is the beginning of his strength, and the right of the firstborn is his. Now, that's given an example. If a man has two wives, and then he wants to give the um, secondborn son um, more of an inheritance above the firstborn son, he has to honor the um has to honor his firstborn son more so above the second one by giving him a double portion but the point was this is given a guideline about if a man has two wives now if the bible was opposed to a man having more than one wife we wouldn't see god saying if this is a law about how to operate if a man has more than one wife we would say god saying well no more than one wife that's you know detestable and that's not allowed now here's another example for you uh, this is Exodus chapter 21. I'm going to go to verse 10. It says, if he take him another wife, well, obviously, if he's going to take another wife, that must mean he first had a wife in order to take another one. It says, if he take unto him another wife, her food, her raiment, and her duty of marriage shall he not diminish. And if he do not these things unto her, then she shall go out free without money. So what that's saying there, say, for instance, if you're in a relationship with a woman for five years and then in the sixth year you go out and get another woman, it's allowed to be in a relationship with both of those women, but you can't take away from the first wife. You have to still, you know, feed her, clothe her, uh, you know, uh, lay with that woman and, you know, so on and so forth, so forth. You can't neglect that woman. Right. So when we talk about having more than one wife. It's not about, you know, oh, you can just go around and sleep with whatever girl you want. Obviously, that's not what it is. Clearly, there's order when it would talk about polygamy and a man having more than one wife. In fact, we're going to find out a little bit later on in the discussion. Hell, even Paul talked about, hell, it's a good thing if a man doesn't even get a woman at all. So does that now mean that we're not allowed to even get one woman? Of course not. He was just given his opinion and his um, advice. You know, during um, during that time, due to certain circumstances that were going on. So again, the whole argument of tonight's debate is like: is it is it allowed? Like, is God considering it a sin if a man gets another wife besides the one his first one? Right? And clearly, that is, the answer to that question is no. Now, some might say it might be an unwise thing, and that's a fair statement. So, in certain instances, it might be unwise for a man to get more than one wife. Say, for instance, some people today can't even afford to feed a wife and two children. So it would be a foolish thing for that bro. man. Okay, I'll, I'll cut it short there. Okay, thank you, uh, Neil or Caden or whatever yeah. you want to call you. Um, you can call me Caden. So. Okay, Caden. So this is an opening uh, opening argument. You'll have a couple of rounds of rebuttals after, but you got uh, right. five minutes to basically lay down your argument as soon as you start talking. Right. Okay. Okay, so yeah, let me um, know if you I, want me to share the screen. Then that goes for either of you guys if you want. Screen yeah, you can share the screen real quick. You can share the screen real quick, please, because okay. I what can't you hear my screen. My, my laptop is actually dog water. What do you um, want can you can you search up uh verse uh Matthew nineteen verse five to six and then Genesis two verse twenty four and then Second Thessalonians two verse fifteen? Is Just there any? Well, Matthew nineteen. Is there any? Uh, particular well I could, I could i could just say it right now i mean i could, I could any translation I could say you'd like it right in? yeah i mean it, it depends on what translation et uses et what, what translation do you use oh you ask me i use king james 
All right, you can use the King James. King James? Okay. Yep. Okay, let me pull this up, and then I'll start your time when you start talking here. Um, All right. Share. And yep. I'll do the same for you, ETT. If you need, you know, scripture brought up, you let me know. And so where do you want it? 19 what? All right, so uh, not, it's 5 to 6, five, 5 to 6. Okay, here you go. Okay, I'm going to start your time. This is your opening argument. you got five minutes. Let's go. All right. And said for this, cause shall a man to leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they stain shall be one flesh, whereby if there are no twain but one flesh, what therefore God has joined together, let no man asunder. So whenever you do marry somebody, you become one flesh, not two flesh. And if we go to Genesis 2, verse 24, it says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Not two flesh, where you can have multiple wives, but it's one flesh. Whenever you have one flesh, you don't have two. So Second Thessalonians 2, verse 15, it also says, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold to the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or by our epistle. So church tradition, it teaches that polygamy is actually... It's it's not a lot. It's like you can't do that, as we see in um, let's see. Yeah, one of the early church fathers that were taught by the apostles, he forbids polygamy. He he says marriage is lawful, but polygamy isn't. We do not indeed forbid the union of man and woman blessed by God as the seminary for of the human race. He says that marriage can, in this context of chapter 2, it says that marriage, yeah, it's lawful for one man to be with one woman and not one man to be with multiple women and woman to be multiple, with multiple men. And um, let's see here, verse. If we go to Deuteronomy 17, verse 17, um, neither shall he multiply wives to himself that his heart not turn out away, neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. We see here, whenever you do have multiple wives, you can be led astray. For example, Solomon, First Kings 11, verse 1 to 3, it explains that King Solomon loved many strange women, and he had 700 wives, princesses, and had 300 concubines, and his wives turned him away from his heart, and he turned them to idols. And we see um, the, the law brought up, well, if we go to Romans 3, verse 28, we're not, we're not justified by the deeds of the law, but we're justified by faith. Just as Romans 4, verse 5 explains it further, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him, justified the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. So, um, if I can continue more, uh, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 2, Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Not have multiple wives, not have multiple husbands, but have a wife and a husband. So, and um, just to further the church tradition, um, John 16, verse 13 to 15, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he shall show you the things to come. He shall glorify you. Hey, bro, me. sorry to cut you off. I just paused your time, but we're getting some pretty crappy audio from you. Like, there's a lot of, uh, sounds like wind in your microphone, like, and I can't hear you. I don't know if anybody okay, else so, is having it. Wait, okay, okay, hold on. I, I I think it's my mic, but basically, uh, if I can continue with the verse, um, he yeah, shall sorry, glorify me. Go but, ahead. That's all good. It's all good. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and he shall show it unto you. All things that the Father had are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. So we see the Holy Spirit guides the church into decisions and stuff, and the churches specifically condemn polygamy they don't condemn marriage but they can condemn um polygamy which says that you got multiple wives and husbands so that's pretty much it okay you do have a minute and a half left for your op opening argument but you can yield your time if you want i could i could yield my time okay yeah i uh as a christian i don't think polygamy is is allowed either but like i said i'm gonna stay out of this um you uh you know i'm a christian ett knows that and he's a hebrew israelite so we have different opinions on things but this is your guys's debate so uh ett <clears throat> you have uh your first round of rebuttal as soon as you start talking do you want me to get some scripture up before i start your time um i can pull it up on my end um but uh, oh, okay yeah okay, so uh, okay cool so Real quick, before I bring up the verses in response, let me pick up on, on what I was saying before I my time ran out. So, yeah, if a man went out 
and he, you know, was low on funds and got with multiple women, of course, that would be a wicked thing because there's clearly duty and responsibility that comes with having multiple women. And clearly I shown with the two examples from the Old Testament, God allowed the man to have more than one wife, but he put guidelines on how to handle more than one woman. So, of course, nobody's saying to just go out and, um, you know, take like 20 women with no responsibility. That's clearly a foolish thing. So one thing that he said I want to comment on, he brought up, when this is common, right? We see people bring this up, but it's Deuteronomy chapter 17. And the 17, well, let's go to 16 real quick. It says, but he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to the end that, that he should multiply horses. For as much as the Lord has said unto you, you shall thenceforth return no more that way. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his heart turn out away. Neither shall he multiply to himself silver and gold. So I want to point out he skipped like three other things. It said horses, silver, and gold. So according to my opponent, if the king has a thousand pieces of silver, is he in sin? And that's something I hope he addresses. If a king has 500 horses, Domino's pepperoni stuffed cheesy bread. Say, for instance, um, King Solomon, he had 700 wives and 300 concubines, which that raises a whole nother question because, wait, isn't that sin? It wouldn't, wouldn't God still consider that to be sin? Because remember, the Bible says in a Malachi 3 6, it says, I, the Lord, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. So, God. He never changed. And even Christ, because I know my my opponent believes Jesus Christ is the father. But even with that narrative, if you read Hebrews uh, 13, 8, it says Christ was the same yesterday, today and forever. So, again, if Christ was the God, which I know that's not the topic of the debate, but just has to be mentioned because it's on topic here. If that was true, well, then he never changed. So if he was OK with uh, polygamy in the Old Testament, by reasoning, he would be OK with it in the new because it says he never changed. So the same judgment God had 3,000 years ago, that's the same judgment and moral statue that he holds to this very day. So that's my response on um, Deuteronomy 17. Real quick, if you can pause my time while I pull up my next precept, I'd appreciate it. Okay, yeah. So, no um, problem, you're to your pause. All right, cool. But... All right, I got it. Thank you. So the other thing the brother uh, brought you up. Share your screen, was, bro, or what? No, I I don't need to share the screen. I, I have a second device. I'm okay, your time is starting then. Ready? All right, cool. Okay, go. So um, and, and if you can, when I'm at 30 seconds left, please give me a warning. Um, so yep. the brother brought up First uh, Corinthians seven. Now notice what he did, and I don't think the brother did it maliciously or anything like that. I think he was just misinformed. He went to verse two. But he skipped first one. So let's first read the second verse. It says, nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Good verse. But let's read up. Verse one, it says, now concerning the things Rev, you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to even touch a woman. So Paul's saying, hell, don't even get married. It's a wise thing to not even get a woman. Right. So we say that Paul's going off for saying that, uh, it, it's a wise thing for a man not even to get a woman clearly no he's just giving his um advice on the topics you know in the end times that we're in today it might be a wise thing for a man to remain single you know due to the bad times that we're coming in and might want to get married. nothing wrong with that but then if there's a third man who wants to get with two women let's say if he's been married to one woman for say 10 years and then he wants to get married with another woman. Again, not leave the first, but be married to both of them. You, nobody can show in the New Testament or Old Testament where it, he would not be allowed to do that. Because I have shown where it is allowed. I have shown where God doesn't change. And I've shown where he clearly gave the um, the permission to go ahead and uh, and do it. And I have one more uh, hard hither, but I'll, I'll save that for a little bit later on, which is in the New Testament, by the way. Um, Let me see real quick. But you know what? I'll I'll cut my time short with that because I am very interested to see what Neo would say uh, to the uh, to the. Oh, let me comment real quick on on the the one flesh together, because the Bible says that 
we all together are like one body in Christ. So when the Bible talks about a man and a woman being one flesh, that doesn't literally mean that they morphed into one like literal being. It's clearly metaphoric, meaning the man is the head of the woman. In fact, the Bible even says that Christ is the head of a man and the man is the head of the woman. Does that literally mean that the woman loses her head and the man takes it over? No, it's clearly just talking about like authority, right? So when it says to become one flesh, it doesn't literally mean that they're one literal body, obviously. And I'll give an example, just like how Christ talked about the church being one body. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. It says, for as the body is one and have many members, all the members of that one body being many are one body, so is also Christ. So same with a man and a woman being one flesh. So a man can be one flesh with three women. It just means that he's um, in, a, in a marriage with them. That's simply what it means. But anyway, I forfeit the rest of my time. And uh, Neo, you can go ahead. Okay, right on. So that was your first rebuttal. And uh, Caden, you got your first uh, five-minute rebuttal. All right. As soon as you're ready, let me know okay. and I'll start your time. All right, I'm oh, ready, do you I'm want ready. me to bring up scripture before I start your time? Um, no, no, no. You don't got to. You don't got to. Okay, go ahead then. All right. So number one, you start in my argument. De Deuteronomy 17 is explicitly saying that if you multiply your riches and wives, it can lead you away from God. For example, money leads to sin, and whenever Solomon had multiple lives, it led them to adultery, as the uh, King's verse says. And Corinthians is not saying it's a sin to have a wife, but it's basically teaching. That if we can't avoid fornication, we should get a wife, but not multiple wives. But it is a good thing to not also be married, as the first verse says. So that's that's quite literally what it was about. And um, let's see the uh, flesh one. So whenever you marry somebody, essentially you both become connected and you both become one flesh. And, and the verses you brought up, I mean, it did have a good point, but whenever we specifically say that, you know. A body has multiple members. Yeah, they do have multiple members, but essentially it's different for marriage, marriage because whenever you do marry somebody, you marry that person, and then y'all become one as he is one with the father, right? So essentially, um, um, like, for example, a woman has arms, legs, and everything else just like that, and a man has his arms, legs, whatever. So whenever they come in together, they become one, even though they have multiple parts of their body. It's not saying that you know, there's multiple humans. Essentially, it's not saying there's, hey, there's multiple humans that make up this body. It's saying that there's just multiple body parts that make up this body. That's essentially what it was saying. Like, for example, uh, Christ has arms, legs, feet, all that. Yep. And that leads to basically a full body, which is Christ himself. And we have a full body. We have arm, legs, limbs, and all that. And that leads to our full body. But multiple women, multiple humans, they don't all come like, like, for example, um, whenever it says one wife and one man should marry and they will be connected into flesh. It's not saying you should have two wives and then all of you guys should be connected into flesh. It's saying one. It specifically says one. There's no distinction between that. And in fact, um, the verses that you brought up, it was explaining that uh, basically if you do have two wives. They inst he instructs you on how to handle that situation. It's not saying, hey, you can have two wives. It's saying if you do have two wives, it's instructing you on how to handle the situation out. All right. I, I apologize. Right, that's, my uh, internet cut out on me. Okay. It's all good. So that's pretty much um, my rebuttal. All right. But, but just so you know, bro, I didn't get to hear like the last 25 seconds because my internet cut out on me. Could if you could like sum it up, you don't have to say everything though. Wait, 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 hold on, hold on. Wait, say that. Hold on, my, my internet. Yeah. Wait, yeah. say that one more time. Yeah, real quick. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yo, yo. You. Okay. Uh, yeah, I said my my internet's giving me an yeah, issue. Yeah. I got I got disconnected. Just came back, so I didn't hear. I heard like two. Two things out of what you said, man. So I, I really didn't get to hear anything out of that. So if you could pick like well, two points. I could basically. I'm a, I could, oh, I, I, I heard could what you said about basically. Solomon. So I heard first, that. Yeah. Okay. So essentially, um, whenever 
uh one flesh like like two like a woman and a man unites into one flesh essentially whenever we talk about the body of christ he has like arms legs and all that and that all makes up one body so whenever a woman and a man they they come together in one flesh they essentially become one body despite having multiple members it's not saying that they have multiple humans it's saying multiple members part of their body as in like arms legs feet and all that so and um another point the uh, verse that you brought up it doesn't allow uh uh two wives it's just saying that if there is a situation where you do have two wives real quick what verse is that the you're talking about the one in Deuteronomy or Exodus? Yeah, Deut Deuteronomy. I forgot. I think it was Deuteronomy twenty something. You brought up. It was Deuteronomy it twenty one. It, it, instructs, it instructs the uh, man if he has two wives. Well, it doesn't allow a man to have two wives in every. Yep. Okay. It's your time. You got your your last round of rebuttal, and then we'll go to Caden, and then we'll do the cross examination, then the back and forth. Okay. All right. So sounds good. Got I got five, five minutes, minutes for your second round. Go ahead. Okay, very good. Uh, I first want to uh, be polite and say I do apologize to Caden that um, I had to have him uh, reiterate some of the things he said. But again, it wasn't my problem. Uh, or, excuse me, it wasn't my, uh, wasn't my fault. My internet cut on me, so I do apologize. Um, but I did hear what he said about Solomon, right? He said, oh, well, you know, Solomon's wise. They led him to sin. But that's not actually correct. Uh, if we go to First Kings chapter uh, 11 and verse 3, it says, And he had 700 wives and princesses, and these uh, hunt 300 concubines and his wives turned away his heart. For it came to pass when Solomon was old, and that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord, as was the heart of his father David. Now, I don't disagree that David's wives, they led him in the, the wrong direction, but the wives themselves, that wasn't the sin. The sin was that he worshipped other gods. They led him after other gods, but the women themselves weren't the sin. And as far as the brother brought up, let me see real quick. If you can pause my time real quick, Nick, while I pull this up. Okay. Okay, I got it. So, um, uh, Neo uh, referenced back to a verse I brought in one in my opening about uh, Deuteronomy 21, 15. I'll read the top again. It says, if a man has two wives, one beloved and another hated, and they have borne him children, both the beloved and the hatred, hated, and if the force, firstborn be hers that was hated, then it shall be when he makes his sons to inherit that which he has, he may not make the son of the beloved firstborn before the son of the hated, and so on and so forth. But it's given a, a law about if a man does have two wives, he's not allowed to give the second-born son a greater inheritance than what rightfully belongs to his firstborn son. But it's if this was a sin, God would call the man out for having two wives. But it's saying if a man does have two wives, and it leaves it at that, like it doesn't say that this is a bad thing or immoral. And again, this is in the law. So if it was wicked, we would see something saying that this was not allowed. But God's giving a law about if a man does have two wives, and he has two children by them, he has to honor the firstborn uh, above the secondborn. So I don't see where he's getting that from, that it's not saying here that it's allowed to have two wives or God just accepted it for a time. It, I don't see that here. So the burden of proof would be upon him to prove that to me. And real quick, I'm going to pull up uh, Matthew chapter 25. And one, I don't think I'm going to be able to read the whole thing here due to my time restraint. But if you read uh, Matthew chapter 25 down to uh, 13, I'll try to read it. It says Matthew 25, 13. It says, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were wise, they were that were foolish, took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But a bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. And all, then all these virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered and said, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. Go ye rather to them that sell and buy, and buy for yourselves. And they went to buy, and the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him unto the marriage. And the door was shut. And afterwards came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. 
Watch therefore and pray, for you know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man cometh. Now, obviously, this is talking about uh, Christ in his second return, but there's a very interesting point here. Christ compared the kingdom unto a bridegroom getting 10 virgins, and at the end of the story, he got five out of the 10. So my question, and this is the nail in the coffin here. My question to, to Neo is, if polygamy is a sin in the New Testament, why is Christ making a parable to something that's sinful? Again, I understand this is a parable, but where else do we see in the Bible where God or Christ, they make a parable about something wicked? We don't see that. So again, this parable, we see 10 virgins going to get with one man. And at the end of the story, the man took five out of 10. Is that not polygamy? So that's one of my hardest hitting points I have in the New Testament here. And this is red letter. So um, with that, I forfeit the rest of my time. And I'm very interested to see how he would um, respond to that. Okay, man. Uh, I believe there's, what, one more rebuttal. And then we jump into... Uh... <clears throat> All right. That sounds good to me. That sounds okay, good. So, one more round. Yeah. So whenever you right, start, Caden, right I'll start your time. All right. So in Deuteronomy, uh, especially, it does not ever allow this um, two wives. It says that if you do have two wives, then they give you the situations on how to handle it. And Deuteronomy 17, verse 17, it quite literally condemns it straight up. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself that his heart not turn or turn not away. And we use Solomon as an example. Because Solomon had multiple wives and they were all adulterers, he decided to follow what they were doing. I'm not saying that him having, you know, because he was led to adultery, that, that means that, oh, um, polygamy is condemned. I'm saying that um, basically, um, so whenever you do have multiple wives, you can be led away from Christ and that's exactly the whole point and um and you know what is it the parable that you mentioned it's talking about um the kingdom in heaven whenever jesus comes like a thief in the night um so you can't really compare that to a polygamy which quite literally is just you know people just marrying multiple women and multiple husbands however much they want essentially um we are like the church is the bride of christ so since we're um essentially since we're um married to christ you know, we can um be, be able to enter into the heavens, like essentially like we can enter into heaven because of that. It's not it's not talking about physical like like physical marriage as in like um you both um committed to each other and you know, you kiss and, and then you just have a family and all that. It's not talking about that specific marriage. It's talking about um essentially spiritual it's a sort of spiritual one. And in in the parable you can't really just take it as literal. Because it's a parable about the kingdom in heaven. Like, for example, there's multiple parables where Jesus says, if you sin, pluck out your eye. We can't really take that as literal. So, in a sense, yeah, you can't really take parables as quite literally that being the case. It's, it's just trying to explain the kingdom of heaven. So, that's, um, what is that? Well, yeah, that's my rebuttal. That's it. Well, that was a short rebuttal. Okay. Let's uh, jump into the, um, you know, the fun stuff here. So we're going to do cross-examination. Um, ETT, yeah. you can start because Caden ended. And uh, you got five minutes to ask questions. Caden, make sure you answer the questions and please try to answer them without asking a question, okay? Right. And then, then it will flip and you, guys, right. and you can do it the other way. All right, so ETT, go ahead, bro. Is there like a limit to how many questions we can ask? Or no, does you just got time limits. Five minutes, five minutes, five minutes, five minutes, so. Okay, cool. So, uh, Kaden, yeah. I got a question for you. Is Isaiah chapter 4, is that past or future? Um, pretty sure that's, I think it's past. Uh, it's essentially a prophecy, right? So I think it yeah. can probably be um, talking about uh, either the events that were prophesied. Okay, you. A question for you: Does the Old Testament have prophecies in it that have not happened? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. For example, um, Daniel seven, where okay. it says that the Son of Man will come. Question for you: Does Jesus lie? No. 
Does Jesus deceive? No. Okay. So when we read uh, Matthew 25, why is it comparing the kingdom to something that's wicked? Again, which, first of all, he didn't even know what the word polygamy means, but I'll, I'll leave it out. Um, so, again, the question for you is if polygamy was evil, why would Christ compare the kingdom to one man getting ten virgins? That's literally the definition of the word polygamy. No, so essentially um, polygamy is having multiple um, wives and multiple husbands. So whenever we, we can't really compare polygamy to um, the uh, parable because it's explaining the kingdom of heaven and how the believers are essentially, you know, the um, the brides and the, the, the people that were picked and the other people who, you know, didn't really obey Christ. Essentially okay, I got, really I got, I'll, I'll take, I'll take the answer. I'll take the answer because right. I'm trying to save time, right? So, real quick, was David rich? Uh, I don't, I don't really know. Just, just to correct you, he was very rich in scriptures. So, with that knowledge, and every historian and scholar would agree with me on this. So, with that understanding, does that mean that um, what was the scripture? Deuteronomy seventeen sixteen. You brought up about the wise, but then it also said horses and silver and gold, he should not multiply it to himself. So did David sin since he had uh, abundance of wealth of gold and silver? Um, well, it depends on what you mean. Like, um, first, if it, it depends if David was led into sin and if, if um, essentially the riches were basically uh, like leading him into like certain stuff like greed and all that but i don't think there's any biblical passage that says that david was led into sin with his money okay next question for you is when did the law change um like um what, what law we're we talking about the works of the law or the law of christ the uh, uh that's people I'm call it the law of moses but i i call it the law of god but what people about. call the law of moses Did you hear it? Um, I don't. I don't think it changed. No. Okay, so with changed, that, with that um, answer, I know that. Okay, real, real quick. All right, so everybody heard that he said he doesn't believe it changed, right? So when we read Hebrews uh, thirteen eight, when it says Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, if Christ is a God from the Old Testament, doesn't that mean he still teaches the law from the Old Testament? No, it's the verse is talking about his divine nature slash essence, essentially. But Jesus is God, yes or no? Yes, his divine nature and essence. That, Let me ask you this. You, you, uh, not, his essence not changing because he's all right, God. Going with that notion, going with that notion real quick. Um, mm -hmm. Since Jesus is God, if we read Malachi 3, 6, it says, I, the Lord, change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not, not consumed. So does God change, yes or no? In his divine nature slash essence, no, he doesn't change because we could see God you know, he repented of doing evil unto some people. And in the context of that verse, is talking about this natural disasters. And we see in Jonah, he he changed, he like, he changed his mind because they was, were going... Uh, they was were, Isaiah they, they, a righteous man, yes or no? Um, He was a prophet, so I, I guess I could say yes. All right, so in Isaiah 4, 1, he says, in that day, seven women will take hold of one man, saying, let's eat, eat their own bread and let's wear thy apparel but let us only be called by thy name to take away our reproach. This is in the future. So why is Isaiah talking about seven women we're getting with one man, which is, literally the, which is literally the meaning of uh, polygamy? Go ahead. Wait, so we said that one more time because... Isaiah chapter wait, 4, verse 1, seven women got with one man. With, is, that, is that exactly what it says? Like seven women yes, got exactly woman. what it says. In that Please tell, you can check it. Yep. What it says. Okay, so so essentially it's a prophecy about some person. Okay, so basically, um, I don't think uh Isaiah was saying that this is essentially, you know, a person that's not sinning. It's referring to somebody that did sin whenever he did do it. All right, that's your time, bro. Okay. Okay, Caden, it's your turn now to ask ETT questions. So um as soon as you start, I'll start your time. All right. So, okay, Et. Um, number one, do you accept the New Testament? Yeah, I believe I believe in the New Testament. 
Okay, do can you accept you? the King James version? I believe in the King James, yes. The, yeah, I can hear you. Do you accept the King James? Okay. Um, so whenever Second Thessalonians 2 verse 15 says that we should hold to the traditions which we've been taught, either by word or by our epistle, um, do you think that's included with the church tradition? Uh, with church tradition, I would say no. I'd say there's a misunderstanding on that. It's talking about the traditions that they uh, held uh, back then. Like, say, for instance, it wouldn't mean, like, down the street from me, I have a Seventh-day Adventist church, right? They'll teach me some some strange tradition that they've carried for hundreds of years, right? But that doesn't mean that it's from the Bible just because they have it. So that would be my answer. Okay, do you think the early church fathers were taught by the apostles? Like, uh, yes, but— let me answer that real quick. I okay. would say yes, but and we live in a twenty. I mean, but that so, wasn't the whole answer. Okay, though. So, I wanted to elaborate. Just five seconds. Yeah, but I, I'm I'm satisfied with that answer. All right, all right. That's just trying to take time. Okay, so if they were taught by the apostles, and Second Thessalonians two verse fifteen explains that we should hold fast to the traditions that they have been taught. Essentially, if the church fathers condemned polygamy, wouldn't wouldn't that quite literally be hold to the tradition? of the apostles and what they I'll, taught I'll them. Answer, I'll, I'll answer it. We in the 21st century don't know what the first uh, century uh, believers, what they accepted and did not accept off of. The only thing we could go off of is what we read on the internet and speculation. So I, I'd say no. Um, yeah, because again, I had the answer limited here, so I'm, I can't really get a chance to elaborate, but that would be my answer. All right, so... Yeah. um. Whenever we go to the certain letters, and especially one of the early church fathers, whenever in chapter two, their thing, oh, let me see, uh, design of uh, treatises, I uh, think, this of uh, personal motives in writing, whenever he was writing about marriage and stuff, and specifically chapter two, is he says that marriage is lawful but not polygamy, and he was taught by um, some of the apostles. Do you think uh, he Sorry, was holding to Bible tradition? Sorry, is this Bible or is this, uh, is this Bible or what book did you get that no, from? Essentially, you agree that you you agree that we're supposed to hold to the traditions which the apostles taught, and essentially the the apostles taught the early church fathers. So, if they condemn polygamy, why why wouldn't the apostles not condemn it either? Well, I, I, the answer I'll give you is I I don't believe that those were early church fathers, uh, and there's no evidence of that other than information you read online. It's a historical fact that these are early church fathers. Eddie. I'll answer that. Even if the, hypothetically, if that's true, that does not take away from what the Bible says. So the Bible says yeah, but, so, polygamy is allowed. So if some, some a man who claims to be apostle says otherwise, I'm going to take what God said above what that man said. Okay, and so okay, so in Luke ten verse sixteen, you want me to? Okay, so in Luke ten verse sixteen, whenever you reject the apostles, do you reject Jesus? You, your question was, whenever you reject the apostles, do you reject Christ? Was your question? Yeah. Uh, I would I would say yes. Okay, so whenever the apostles teach these people these certain things, and they also teach others, do you think if you reject what they teach, you essentially reject the apostles and then essentially reject Christ? For sake of argument, I'll say yes. Okay, so do you think you're rejecting Christ whenever you say that um, whenever this person is teaching that polygamy is not lawful at all, and in fact it's condemned, and he was taught by the apostles, do you think that's, I'll, that's I'll, an, I'll answer I'll, I'll answer that revelation 2 2 we tried those who said they are apostles and are not and we have found them to be liars so no it's just because someone claims to be an apostle that doesn't make them a true apostle go ahead i never said that um the early church fathers were apostles i'm just saying that they were taught by the apostles and they hold fast to the traditions that the apostles taught them so if they teach that right. it is condemned why why would we essentially reject that if they're taught by the apostles directly well if the apostles taught that it was sin we would see that in their epistles and i have yet to see a christian show me that in the apostles epistles yeah but the thing is though we essentially know that the apostles taught these early church fathers these things because in second thessalonians um 2 verse 15 explains that we're called to hold like we're called to hold to these traditions that we've been taught by the apostles we read about a word or by our epistles so essentially whenever we see the church fathers they're taught by the apostles directly and they're teaching that these things are wrong why should we reject the 
why should we reject the early church fathers? Okay, and the, the answer I'll give is these uh, supposed church fathers, um, if they're saying something we can't find in the Bible, then we're supposed to reject what they're saying. And second of all, the what I'll, I'll save that to save you some time. Go ahead. Well, that's the okay, end of the so, time. So the cross examination is up. I guess we could just go into a right. back and forth now if you guys want. Yeah, yeah, we're cool. Hell, like, <laughs> like uh, Kate, I'll, I'll give you credit, man. At least you're able to do a respectful back and forth other than that that zombie Perry Green, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man. It's impossible to debate with that guy. He just screams yeah. at you. <laughs> right, right. Because Galatians 5.22 says, <laughs> if you don't have the spirit in you, you have no self-control, no patience, no kindness. But, yo, know, here, here's an interesting part that maybe we can pick up on. So, um, Caden, when I brought up Isaiah, the fourth chapter, I read the first verse, which, again, you can bring it up to read. That's exactly what it says. I didn't sugarcoat it at all. But then if we read down under that, we clearly see this is talking about right. future tense, as in it didn't happen yet. So, oh, that, then also while you're looking at that, you made a statement in one of your rebuttals and you said, okay. you know, polygamy you basically means. Pardon me? Go ahead. We're having a hard time hearing you, bro. <laughs> Hold up. I bet I'm lagging real quick. Hold on. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, my bad. It's, it's very lagging right now. ET, can you repeat that real quick? Yeah, yeah. I, I brought up Isaiah. You're talking about Isaiah or the polygamy thing I said? I'll take oh, it as Isaiah. Isaiah thing, essentially. Okay, um, yeah. I, I Isaiah the to, fourth. Yeah, then. Uh, yeah, what, what I brought up was Isaiah chapter 4. If we start at verse 1, it says, In that day, seven women shall take hold of one man. And, but then if we read on down in the chapter, we see that this is happening in the future. This hasn't happened yet. So that shows that past the time we're at now, at, there's going to be um, some type of polygamy. And just to clarify something, just to make sure we're on the same uh, term, because you said in your rebuttal that, you know, uh, you know, men and women going around, you know, women getting multiple men or men getting multiple women, you know, polygamy. But then I was like, but wait, but the word polygamy means a man getting with multiple women. So just to clarify, do you agree that the word polygamy means a man getting with multiple different women, not a woman getting with multiple different men? No, because essentially you're saying that Isaiah 4 is talking about women getting, like multiple women getting just one man, right? So it can be, it can quite literally be both. It's essentially like a man getting with multiple women and a woman getting with multiple men. And where do you get that from? If we search up the um basic definition of polygamy. Because as far, as far as I know, they use like two different, um, two different words to, the, 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 can apply to describe to basically both as we know in um biblical terms uh and and, and basically and and basically in biblical terms we know that eve comes from adam's rib cage right so essentially she is also a part of man so that's why i say it can be for both just a side note on that um in uh, genesis 39 when jacob went to laban jacob I mean, Laban told Jacob, you are bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Does that mean that Jacob actually was part of his physical bone? Or did that mean that they were related? The, like they were, um, that they were related in some form? It, it just what means that they're most likely related. But whenever we look at women and men, um, we can quite literally see that women came from a man, quite literally. He, they, they came from man, like a man's ribcage. So they're essentially a part of man also because they were made from man's ribcage. So you All can't right, really fair, compare fair those enough, both situations to... as one is just talking about a relative. Okay, but but he, like Kate, hey, even right, if so, that's true, um, but he, wait, wait, four, all, does, even if that's specific, true, see, how, how does that correlate to yeah. the discussion though? Maybe did you not hear me? Wait, say that again, because I was- I, I said, but hypothetical yeah, yeah, argument, you. right? If if you're right, how does that correlate to the to the polygamy, though? Because essentially, it can be for both. A woman can be with multiple men, and that can be considered polygamy. And a man can be with multiple women, that can be considered polygamy. All right. In the Bible, do we find any just like one example of a woman that was with like five or 
10 different men at one time? Mm, not keep so in mind much, but at one he, time, not not in the past, like one after another. In no, the no, no, no. So no, I don't, I don't, I don't recall one, but I'm, I do know that a woman can't commit polygamy, as we could see in today's society. All right, Neil, you said um, in the Old Testament, you do agree that in the ancient times, God did accept or allow polygamy at some point. You no. agree to that? Um. Well. It, it depends on the context. Like, like, what are you referring to whenever he allows it? Well, just for, well, I, I have a verse that I want to, matter of fact, it's right here. I'll read it for you. Here's like one example, right? If we read um, 2 Samuel chapter um, 12, I'll read verse 7 to 8. It says, And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hands of Saul. And I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have moreover given unto thee such and such things. So God was telling David there, hey, look, I gave you all these things. I gave you, um, you know, your master's wives, you know, his houses, his authority. If that was too little, I would have given you even more. But here we show God giving this man wives. So, again, if God had a problem with a man getting more than one wife, why is God giving David the wives here? That's just one example for you. If you want to pull up the verse, I'll repeat okay. it for you. It's Second so Samuel the, chapter 12, verse 7. The verse at the, like, uh, it was talking about them partaking in a book. I'm sorry, Caden, you're, you're cutting like out a little bit. a prism, just to make sure. I'm sorry, you cut out. Can you repeat? My bad. My internet is so laggy right now. Hell, I, I hear you say on my end, man. <laughs> okay, so, okay, so whenever you said it, did they did they partake in the bosom or did they partake in marriage? Uh, like you're asking with David. But well, like what I'm asking about the who? Samuel thing. About Samuel. so, oh, I'm talking you said about that they were going to a... going to a bosom, right? No, I, I think you're you're mistaken. Um, it's I'll, let me read it again, right? I'll I'll read it for you again. This is Second Samuel right. chapter seven. Excuse me, chapter twelve and verse seven. It says, "And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. This says the Lord God of Israel. I anoint thee king over Israel." And I deliver delivered thee out of the hands of Saul, and I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. So God was telling him, Hey, look, I gave you all these things, I gave you your master's about house, a wives. I would have even given you more if it wasn't enough, is what he's telling them. Go ahead. Okay, so is it is it talking about bosom specifically and not marriage? It's not. It's saying that he had multiple wives come into thy bosom, essentially his chest, right? That's basically what bosom means. So, do you think that's specifically talking about marriage? Well, if it, it's if it says here that he gave him his wives, I would say that he's he would be married to him. To, part, to go into thy's bosom, which is his chest. It's not. It's not talking about marriage. Well, well, well say, say for instance. Say for instance, right? Uh, just to give one hypothetical, like if a man and woman lay in bed, and then the woman lays her head on his chest, that that could be considered her laying her head on his bosom, right? Would you agree with me on that? Um. Yeah, pretty much, because we could see even the disciples lay their heads on Jesus Christ's head. For example, not not head, his chest. For example, John. That doesn't mean that All they're married. Right, but but even hold on a second. Even by your standpoint, though, wouldn't this be wicked, though? Because why would these women be laying with David on his bosom if they're not married to him? Like, wouldn't that be fornication or whatever you call it? Wouldn't that be wicked? Well, it's not a sin to lay onto somebody's chest, especially a man's. As we could see, John doing it towards Jesus, like John the disciple of Jesus, like he quite literally lit. Yeah, laid but, but I mean, in Jesus. that context, I mean, in that context, it clearly explains that he laid upon his shoulder, right? 
No, in the context, it says that they partook in their abysm, essentially. Like, it, there's multiple I mean, verses where it says that people are laying in um certain bosoms. Like uh, Abraham's bosom, for example, and stuff, so on and so on. It's not a sin to put your head on somebody's chest. It's it's a sin whenever you marry that person and have another wife. All right, f f fair enough. But but even with this argument, right, it says that he gave David um, souls and wives. So David has multiple wives. So, so like, let me understand. So you're saying that God gave David these women that he can he like have in his house, but he didn't he lay with these, these women. They weren't his wives. Says that he gave the wives to, to partake. You're you're cutting up again, man. Okay, so hold on. Can you hear me? Okay, so yeah, um, good. it says to partake in thy bosom. I'm not saying specifically to partake in marriage. Like he gave the wife so they can partake in marriage. Instead, it says to partake in thy bosom, as in laying their head on his chest. It's not saying that they be, they became married, because and also um another thing. Whenever you said about that one prophecy that was talking about the woman um going to a man there's multiple prophecies of people sinning so you well, can't you said really multiple prophecies of people sinning oh but 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 again though but that puts yeah, you in the like, box because when you read the chapter thing. it's talking about a future um like, like hold on a second let me see can i uh let me see if yeah, i can pull it up and I'll, I'll, I'll show you i'll show you I mean, real quick Hold, hold on a second, Caden. Let me let me just bring this up. I'll, I'll read a little bit so you can see this is a future context yeah, here. About, yeah, the prophecies are talking about the future, it, like quite literally. Like you can prophesy about somebody, um, you know. Wait, so, so saying, you're saying example, here. Uh, but, Jesus, he prophesied about Wait, Jesus. wait, so, so let me understand Jesus this. You're saying about Isaiah Jesus 4, he's honest. talking about people in the future committing sin is what you're saying. Real quick, do you, do you mind if I read Wait, it just so you can? Let, let, let me let me just read no, it. You and then said you that. Listen. You said that. No, I said according, from, according from what to what I'm trying to understand your argument. Yeah, is yeah. That what what I said according to what you're saying, it sounds like you're saying that the the seven woman getting with one man here that he's writing about people sinning. Basically, that's what it sounded like you were saying. No, essentially, I'm saying that it's you can prophesy about people, you know, committing a sin. For example, uh, Jesus prophesied about Peter denying him three times, and guess what? It happened, even, and that happened in the future. So, real quick, it Neo, when, when a man and allowed, a woman, it was prophesied. okay, when a man and a woman get married, commonly, what happens? Does the woman take on the name of the man? Um, uh, I don't really. That know happens. Much to, about, that happens um, today, right? Like, does it? Does like I just uh, um went to a marriage a couple months back and that happened there, right? Like you would agree, at least in American custom, the woman takes on the last name um, or some type, some part of the name yeah. of the husband, right? Yeah. All right. So when we go to chapter four and verse one, in the latter part, it says, look, it says, only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. So why are these women asking this man to be called by his name? What that mean that they're like getting in some type well, of relationship with that man? Probably, but the thing is though, wait, like probably. You the but what that you can't prophesy about people coming. Okay, but yeah, like, I'm like, saying, like, I'm trying to explain uh, right now. Okay, but but Neil, so, let, let me let just, just so you can understand the context, right? Because again, I want to give you a fair chance, but I, I'm uh, like just, just hear me out for five seconds. Saying, no, that's the thing. Okay, but but Neil, just hear me out five seconds. I'm gonna read a little bit down so you can see this is talking about the future. So then you can re restate what you're saying because I I don't think you're familiar with this chapter. So let's just read verse two. It says, "In that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. And it shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion." And he that remaineth in Jerusalem shall be called holy, even, even every one that is written among the living in Jerusalem, when the Lord have washed away the filth of the dollars of Zion, and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. So, let me see, do I want to continue on? 
Yeah, I'll, I'll read the last two verses. It says, And the Lord will create upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion and upon her assemblies a cloud and smoke by day and the shining of a flame of fire by night and upon all the glory shall be a defense. And there shall be a tabernacle for a shadow in the daytime from the heat and for a place of refuge and for a covered from storm and from rain. So when we read this whole chapter, which I did there, it clearly shows that this is the future. That this clearly has not happened yet. So I, I'm just intrigued to see how you could respond to that now that we heard the entire chapter in its context. Go ahead. Can I can I clarify now? Okay. Sure. Hold ahead. on. Can you can you hear me? Yep. Can we can? Okay. So whenever we say, uh, for example. Like what I just said, you can't prophesy about people sinning. Um, for example, Peter did not like when Jesus prophesied that Peter would deny him three times, and Jesus also prophesied that Judas would betray him. So essentially, it's not saying that oh, since this since this prophecy was talking about it, it's allowed. Essentially, it's saying that this will just happen in the future. It's like prophecy is quite literally prophesying about the future events. So it, right, doesn't, but, uh, it doesn't even allow politics. Okay, but but Neil, and, and, and all, with all due respect, I, I think you stepped on the bear trap with that, though, brother. Because when you because say for this, right? You're saying verse one that's talking about people in the future committing sin, but then in verse two, let's continue on, and it says, "In that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious." So if the verse above it is talking about people committing sin, why is the verse under it talking about in that day, which, wait a second, the day is talking about the day in verse one. I'll read verse one again. It says, it says in that day shall seven women take hold of one man. And then going to verse two, it says, in that day shall the branch of the Lord be glorious and beautiful. So it seems like that's not that doesn't seem like sin right there because the same day is being talked about in both verses. And then in verse two, the Lord calls that day glorious and beautiful. So I don't I don't get that one. Okay, that, so that can thing. I ask you a question real quick? Sure, go ahead. Can I ask you a question real quick? On the yeah. day of the Lord, is um the devil still present? Uh yes. Okay, do you think the devil tries to sin whenever he in on the day of the Lord? Well, that that would that would be a whole nother uh discussion because I don't view Satan the same way that you do. So that would be a whole different point of con okay, so that would be a whole different is point is of evil, right? You s said what? The, okay, so my so basically my question is do you think there's still gonna be sin whenever the day of the Lord happens, whenever Jesus, you know, comes back? Well well obviously up until that day the people hell people are just going to be walking around not paying attention to anything until christ appears in the sky hell it tells you in the apocrypha that christ will appear to the astonishment of all that dwell upon the earth it's going to happen in a day that people don't think that it's going to happen and we see that warned to us all throughout the gospels that it's coming in a day that you know people are not looking for it so yeah, yeah you know so up until is, christ comes back there's going to be people sinning Okay, so, so whenever Christ does come back, there's still going to be people sinning. Then after that, he yeah. wipes them all out. Yeah. Okay, so explain to me, the day of the Lord can have sin. Whenever that day is described to be God's judgment, essentially, how can that day have sin? Well, could you first clarify what is the day of the Lord? Can you clarify from your understanding what that is? Um, whenever Jesus Christ comes back, right? So, if, if Christ is coming judge, back, uh, every... right? So, let me just understand this if Christ, whenever is coming Christ back, comes back, he's, he's gonna have a thousand year reign, right? Yeah, just hold on for a second. So, when Christ comes to judge the world, when he arrives, are people in the world in sin that he's coming to judge? Yeah, right? Yeah, so essentially, whenever he does come back, he's going to bring his a thousand year millennium and he's going to judge the inhabitants. On the right. earth, he's going to yeah, quite literally yep. judge, and guess what? He's judging them for their sin. Do you think the day of the Lord, which is described as the thousand year millennium reign, which is quite literally, um, pretty sure it's described as New Jerusalem, do you think that day has sin in it? 
the day when Christ comes back, there's going to be people alive who have or and commit sin. Like okay, I, so I don't, do you, I don't know how what do other there will be a sinless day, as in like no sin will happen in that day. Uh, I mean, hell, like say for instance, right when Christ comes back, there's going to be people say 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 in Africa that are committing sin as Christ is over over the United States doing what he you know jacking this place up. So yeah, sin's still going to happen on that day, but those people are going to get judged for it. Okay, so on yeah, that like day, I'll, I'll give you an to... example. I, I'm sure somewhere in the world there's going to be a murder that happens before Christ arrives, but on the same day. So that would be sin happening on that day, right? Because you, cause you okay, agree so, a, a so, day is more than an hour, okay, right? So, wait, wait, okay, hold so, on, just clarify so, that. A day is more than an hour, right? So uh, a lot I'm of things sure can happen that. in a day, right? Well, I'm pretty sure in the context of that verse, it's quite literally like a full day and a full hour. Like as in like, there, well, well, nobody again, the, uh, day I, or I hour of that time that happens. So, and just so I know, the day you're talking about it. is still in Isaiah, right? It's Isaiah 4, that's the I'm day talking you're talking about. about. Okay, so do you think in the day specifically for the day? No, so essentially I'm just trying to compare um, basically the two on how a day, like the day of the Lord can still be with sin and that day also. It doesn't mean like the whole world was sinless at that time for Isaiah. Wait, you said at that time. So so now it sounds like you're saying that this happened already because you said at that time. Hey, guys, I want to get wrapping this up soon, but I would like to say, ETT, what about you? I want to debate you on this subject, bro. I, I really I don't feel like Caden was well prepared for it, even though I think he did a pretty good job. But uh, I would really like to debate you on this topic, bro, if we can set that up. Yeah, we can set that up. But yo, I was kind of just biting my fingers through the whole through the whole thing. There's so much I wanted to jump in there and say, but like, I didn't yeah, really yeah, that, that's guys. cool, Nick. Yo, yo, keep this video up, man, because this no, was a to. good back and forth. But yeah, no, we, we can set up sure. a discussion. Yeah, it we can set up show. a discussion. That's All totally right. fine. Do you guys want a couple All more right, minutes? So, so can, yeah, yeah. Um, if you don't mind, maybe give us like ten more minutes to wrap it up. Maybe he can ask one or two, and then I can ask one or two, and then we'll wrap it up. When do you want to do the debate, ETT? Uh, I mean, I, I don't know what I'm doing the next couple of days, man, okay. but I'll keep in contact with you and then we could set something up. Okay. All right. All right. Let you guys have a few more minutes. And Caden, I'm not saying right. you did a bad job or anything, bro. I just feel like there was so much that I wanted to get off my, my chest. Right. That's why I'd like to set up another it's one. Good, it's good. Yeah. Like Caden, right, so... I'll, I'll give, I'll give you credit, man. You know, it's a, it's a good thing that a young guy like yourself is on here doing this, but do remember I myself also was on YouTube teaching when I was 14. I've been in the truth for 10 years now, right? So, you know, over the course of time, you, uh, you know, learn more, right? And that goes for all of us. Hell, I'm still learning every day, as the old saying goes, right? So yeah, man, uh, it was a, you know, decent conversation, which, you know, you can go if you got one or two other things to bring up. But uh, oh, like, like, say, let's say, for instance, one thing, one last thing I'll bring up, and then I'll give you the last chance to ask if you have son, is right. when we were talking about King Solomon and his wives, right? You said that his wives led him to sin, but I brought up the verse that said his wives led him away to follow after other gods. So the sin he committed yeah, was not having the wife, but he they led like, him like, into let, sin. Like, like, like Hayden, let, let me give you, let me give you an example. Uh, okay, 17 but, verse 17. okay, but Caden, let, let me show you something. Adultery, and et cetera, et cetera. Did, did they deceive him by leading him away to follow other gods? Essentially, um, since his heart, um, I think, yeah, essentially his heart got deceived into, you know, right, right. following so, him. So say, for, say, for instance, Caden, let, let me give you an example of how that doesn't cetera, make sense. The heart is All right, just hold on a sec, brother. Like, say, for instance, I can show you in the Bible where it says that God leads people astray. That doesn't mean that God sins just because he puts people in a direction. So in, I agree. Oh, hold, hold, just, in, just real quick. So, so say, for instance, when where did Solomon God had those wives. Thing. Well, well, again, I, I wanted to get into that. But since Nick wanted to keep it to one topic, I, I didn't bring up verses on that. But like, I'll give you one example. If you read First Kings chapter 22, start at 19 and read down to like 23. God sent a deceiving spirit to lie to a king. Oh, yeah. I said if you guys want to set up another show on that, obviously I didn't want to debate 
two topics right, right, to be right but if right, you want exactly. to have another show on does god create evil essentially it's still on the it's still on the topic it's still on the topic because essentially um, it's not on the topic well yeah nick, nick let, no, we'll so save it for, we'll it. save it for another night we'll save that for another night mm -hmm. if you guys want to have another debate on did god create evil or does god create evil i'm more yeah, yeah i'm down that. for it because because neil let me say this man i uh, once again i mentioned earlier right i saw you all did a discussion with my guy uh rudy which he did a decent job he got a couple of things uh misunderstood but overall he did a decent job on his point but yeah i wanted a chance to chime in on that so hopefully in the near future uh we'll be able to yeah, do we'll that do conversation that. We can do that later. yeah for right. sure i'll set that but, up for you guys but um the thing is though um to clarify what i meant uh essentially you essentially reject the early church fathers right um, all, all I'll say off of it, the only church fathers I go off of is the apostles we read about in the Bible. Anybody other than that, I wouldn't consider them to be a inspired man of God. Now, that doesn't mean that there wasn't a man in the past who might have been inspired that I might not know about. Sure. But as far as teaching and doctrine goes, I only go by what we find in the Bible. Not Do you off think of the apostles can teach heresy? false apostles can like say for instance revelation chapter 2 verse 2 it says we have tried those who said they are apostles and are not and we have found them to be liars so there are some men out there who claim to be apostles, apostles who are not talking about the 12 apostles mentioned in the bible that taught their church fathers do you think they can teach heresy no but you in the 21st century you don't know what they taught the early church fathers you're just taking a guess Okay, because the early just church fathers something you, hold, hold on, you're based just on believing second. something you read online. That, that's really what you're doing. No, it's quite literally in the Bible. We're called to hold on to traditions. Let, let me ask you a question. The apostles uh, taught these people. So why would they teach heresy if the apostles quite literally taught them with their, their teeth? Well, what, once again, the, the way I'll answer your question. Wait, say that. I hold would... on. Okay. So, so essentially, Second Thessalonians it explains that we're called to hold to the traditions that the apostles did. So, if the apostles themselves they taught these early church fathers, and they taught them everything that they know, and they begin to teach other people what they learned from the apostles, and you reject that, then essentially you're also rejecting the apostles' teachings, and then you're rejecting Jesus Christ. All right. Do Answer you, to me. Where, where can I – hold on. Where, where can I read about these early church fathers? Are you talking about like on Google somewhere or like where, where can you read about if these you, guys? If you go to the um, – if you go to newavenant.org, it, it quite literally puts all the letters. So, so that, that's on the internet right? somewhere, right, which can be uh, fabricated, correct? Yeah, it puts all the letters. It put all the letters into a website, and the Bible quite literally is on a website. Does that mean that it's fabricated? No. So. No, but but Katie, I think you are smart enough to realize that sometimes things that you read on the internet are not true, right? Yeah, but the thing is, these are the early church fathers' letters, so you can't really deny that. But again, just because somebody's an early church father, that that doesn't make that. That was doesn't make what the they're apostles. saying completely true. They were taught by the apostles directly. Like, they would have not known anything. They wouldn't even probably understood most of these concepts if it wasn't for the apostles. So, essentially, the way they learned... Hey, hey, all, all, all I'm going to tell you, all I'm going to tell you, Caden, when, when we talk about early church fathers, that's extra biblical sources. That, that would be going out of the Bible. But the way we debate a subject is by staying in Scripture. Let's like, say, for instance, I could ask you like, what did Thomas Edison say about such and such topic? And then I'll say, well, what the hell is he? What, what, how is he even relevant to the topic? He wasn't included in the Bible. You know, so when we go to these, whether they're early or uh, fourth century scholars or apostles, that's extra biblical sources. But that's not from the inspired Bible. And the information we get about those men can be fabricated okay, so, and mistranslated so over time. That explains so the, re the re reason why I'm going to these certain traditions, especially the early church for condemn polygamy. So the the Bible quite literally teaches us to hold to these traditions. So like that's that's why I go.
towards them. I, I got a question like, for I, you. If you're saying and, that we and, should uh, go to the Bible, I went to the Bible and they told me. Okay, to then this, is, this will be my last question What's for up? you. Uh, the, it, let's say, for instance, in Matthew 15 or Mark 7, did Christ um, tell the Pharisees that they were wrong by holding to certain traditions? Yeah, but the Pharisee well, one, tradition one, is different from the church tradition. As in the church is guided by the Holy Spirit and guided by the Holy Spirit. But people, religious people the of the day the believe those men to be holy. Wait, but Caden, people, religious people back then thought those people were holy, right? Like righteous men? Um, essentially, they, 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 were thought, they, they were thought to be holy because they kept the law, which doesn't justify you at all. But whenever we look at the early church fathers, um, they're different from the Pharisees as they they quite literally teach what the apostles taught them. So if you do reject the early church fathers, you essentially reject what the apostles taught them. And whenever you do reject that, you essentially reject the apostles and then essentially reject Jesus Christ. That's quite literally the whole point, as Luke 10 verse 16 says. Got address. So um, the, also, again, with all, all due respect, Hayden, you know, you did lose this discussion tonight, but I do give you respect for coming out and having the conversation. I will give you that.